Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the second webinar of this academic year's CACDAS Networking Projects webinar series. I'm Sarah Bullock, and I'm joined today by my colleague, uh, Christina Silva. And our webinar today is going to be given by Brigitte Smith. Today, Brigitte Smith is going to be sharing with us some information about how the tool Atlas TI might support us in the work of undertaking scoping reviews. Brigitte is a longtime user of Atlas TI, an experienced researcher and a teacher of methods, and a long-term friend of the CACDAS Networking Project, having engaged in our events for many years, including presenting at our conferences. So it's really great to have you here, Brigitte. Thank you. Brigitte is a twice National uh, Research Foundation rated researcher, a qualitative research methodologist, Atlas TI accredited senior professional trainer, and a member of the NRF Specialist Committee for Education, and also editor for the International Journal of Qualitative Methods and co-editor of the International Journal of Multiple Approaches. She's presented over 300 papers and workshops nationally and internationally. It's a great pleasure to have you here with us. Okay, so um, with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to Brigitte now. Thanks very much for being here, everybody. It's great to have such a great turnout. Enjoy the webinar. Excellent. Okay, a very warm good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I trust you will enjoy this next 40 minutes, 45 minutes or so with us um, as I infotain you. That is a word that I've made up, by the way, um, of a little bit of entertainment and obviously uh, hopefully some information. You will notice, hopefully, in my voice that I am an informal um, lecturer. You, you may call me Bridget. I really don't do titles, although I have worked for them. And um, just a small correction, um, the Pretoria University or the University of Pretoria uh, is my alma mater. That means this is where I did all my degrees. And now I am a visiting professor as per um, slide here in the signature and an assistant adjunct at the University of Alberta. So, and my last university was the University of South Africa. Be that as it may, um, this is where I am now, um, playing a little bit in, in the academy and not having to report to anybody, um, loving really what I do with regards to research support, teaching Atlas TI workshops, and also now these days um, I also teach a little bit of in vivo and so forth. So, um, so yeah, all good. Uh, Sarah, no need to apologize. Right, so the, the talk today then is um, Atlas TI, and I just assume, which is probably a big assumption, that most of you will have seen Atlas TI, have heard of Atlas TI, and even use it. Um, if that's not the case, then it's also okay. You will not be uh, shown out of the room. On the contrary, please stay put and let's have a look how far we can take you with regards to scoping reviews and the use of software. Um, just for those who do not know what Atlas TI is, it's a qualitative software that assists us with qualitative data and or also theoretical data. And that is why we can also speak these days freely about Atlas TI and literature reviews, Atlas TI and systematic literature reviews, Atlas TI and scoping reviews and so forth. I trust that that makes sense. So let's then always start on a light note. And, um, and whether you're writing an article or your PhD or you're busy with your master's, it doesn't really matter. This is research. It's, it's really messy. And whether you're doing a literature review, a scoping a review, a systematic literature review, the processes with regards to choosing a topic and defining questions and collecting the data, or in this instance, collecting the articles are, uh, are or e these, these are messy processes and, um, and so forth. So I just thought um, I'd just uh, give you a bit of a nightmare <laughs> kind of slide so that you don't sleep tonight. No, 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 I'd like you to sleep tonight. Right, just one or two references that I would really like you to, to source. Um, when we started speaking about, um, or when I started thinking about, um, you know, how can we possibly optimize the use of Atlas uh, TI uh, and qualitative data analysis and so forth, this article set me, uh, you know, ahead of time in the sense, it was written in 2012, by the way, 
And then I started thinking about, you know, why don't we use then Atlas TI for articles and so forth. Needless to say, colleagues, I'm giving my age away. I started in the DOS or just after DOS version kind of uh, completed its its work. And then we started with Windows in, in, in Atlas TI version 4. We are now on 9. So you can make up the years in terms of how old I am. That's a little riddle for today. Anyway, be that as it may. Um, colleagues, this is a dear friend of mine and colleague, and, um, Anthony Onvokbuzi, who's now in Cambridge, by the way, in England, and, um, and he is a researcher of note, and he wrote this paper many moons ago, and I would really want to encourage you to get hold of this. It's it, The qualitative report is also a journal, by the way, that is uh, open source, so you don't have to pay for this article, but it certainly directs you in terms of thinking qualitatively about literatures. Okay, I put that in, in plural on purpose, so just as a bit of a heads up. Um, then he also wrote this book. It calls it the Comprehensive Literature Review, but there's room for everybody in this book, for scoping reviews, for systematic literature reviews, and what I would call the traditional uh, literature review and or the literature study, because I discern between those two. So if you want to take a look at this book. Last but not least, yes, I also did a little something. Um, it was actually published this year in the International Journal of Qualitative Methods. I happen to be the editor for Africa for this journal. And a colleague and I, Vanessa Sherman, who's actually a quantitative methodologist, and she and I, we work very closely together. And we wrote this little editorial. So if you want to have a look at that, just to support perhaps from an academic perspective of what I am doing here this afternoon or this morning, wherever you are. So what are scoping reviews and so forth? You can have a look at this article. Okay, um, I'm not going to read all my slides because I will simply not get done. I prepared 55 slides. Um, on the other hand, though, I also believe rather give too much than too little, rather <laughs> over promise than under promise. Just in terms of uh, some definitions, and this is for our young students and young scholars, perhaps, and I know there are many professors in this room probably, but we do discern between a literature study and a literature review. Very briefly, the literature review is a standalone. It's as if you only do theoretical, i.e. or conceptual work, whereas a literature study, you also do what you have to do in terms of searching the literature and understanding the literature, but it goes hand in hand with empirical work. What does that mean? It means those the work that you collect and the data that you collect out in the field in very simple English, and you will notice that I try and keep it very simple. Desktop research is kind of a, a bit of both, and it also, and in terms of the reviewing of the literature, it also includes gray literature, which the um, scoping review also includes, and also non-academic um, 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 information sources. And then we also have a document analysis, which can be part of um, the empirical work. So I just thought, let me just give this to you and um, so that you have this to, to, yeah, for future use. Yeah, you're very welcome. These slides will also be made available. So colleague scoping review, I mean, if you Google it, I mean, there are so many articles and so many references and so many this and so many that. So I'm not going to read every single bullet here, but I do think some of the things need to be said. And so let's just go right to the, to the third bullet here. That is scoping review or scoping study, and you will notice that the language for this thing called scoping review is also not consistent. There are a number of different ways how these things are labeled, and, um, and that makes it sometimes a little bit tricky. But I've given you later on some slides, put them all in one family and said, right, this is what we consider to be scoping reviews. But in brief, dear colleagues, it is a form of knowledge synthesis that addresses an exploratory research question aimed at mapping key concepts, the types of the evidence that are that were, were mentioned in, in those in those articles and the gaps in the literature related to defined area or field. And the process of searching, selecting, synthesizing existing knowledge. Colleagues, and then I don't forgive me if I'm too simplistic about this, but I've also learned, you know, rather keep it simple than too highfalutin, if I may. Um, you know, what does this word synthesis actually mean? And, and I have a very simple, bridged way of saying this, and that is putting it together in a fresh and a new and innovative way, uh, the way we present um, these reviews so that people would actually learn from them. So, um, yeah. 
They're commonly used to better understand a phenomenon and to evaluate, evaluate, sorry, where research on a topic has or has not been completed. Sometimes scoping reviews are used uh, as a first step uh, for conducting a systematic review. And I, I like to work with metaphors and narratives and these things, and I don't really have much time to do all these funny things. But I do want to take you to a submarine. I trust you all know what a submarine is, and I just learned uh, from my dear colleague in Surrey that she is swimming in very warm waters. No, she's swimming in freezing waters, colleagues, and this is where perhaps the submarines would also find her. I'm just making jokes as I go, in case you hadn't noticed. But when the submarine kind of surfaces, it puts out a little looking uh, tool, okay? Call that a scope or a scoping, I don't, I don't have a really good English word for this, but they scope the area to see whether there is a, where, you know, where is the enemy, so to speak, and if we speak war times. So scoping means literally having a look around, but we do this a little bit more systematically than the submarine just having a look around if there are other ships in the area. So anyway, just to give you an idea of what scoping is, to scope something. Okay. So you wish to answer then, or the broad question to investigate what has been done in the field, and then with, yeah, okay, that's all for now. Right, they have a great utility, that means they're very useful for, for synthesizing, combining, presenting in a fresh way, and are often used to categorize existing literature in a given field. Um, sometimes colleagues here in the middle of that first bullet still, Scoping reviews are confused um, and, and, and perhaps interchangeably used with mapping reviews, which is slightly different. You can have a look at that. And then if you can find the resource of Grant and Booth, they do a lot of work on scoping reviews and, um, and so forth. And we'll get to, these are just some of the definitions, and I'm going to skip uh, some of them. Okay, all in the family. Reviews, systematic lit reviews, you get rapid reviews, you get scoping reviews, evidence maps, realist reviews, the list is endless. And I've actually given you to that end um, also, which are a typology, which is on the next slide. Other views for scoping reviews or other name typologies, um, is people refer to scoping studies, systematic scope review, scoping report, and so forth. So this in itself is confusing for our students, okay? So that is, it is, it is, it is, yeah, and, and that is why you really closely have to see, look at the title of your, of the papers that you are looking at. Perhaps you want to get a good example with regards to a scoping review and um, so forth. This is Grant and Booth. Colleagues, this is a really cool, very cool, very academic. No, this is a really good article, and I strongly suggest that you also get hold of this, where the 14 types of associated methodologies are, are explained, they are reviewed and labeled, and so forth, and that is um, really helpful. So if you want to have a look at this one. Colleagues, then the next, so this, these were just some definitions, okay, just very quickly. I hope I'm going to make it with time. Colleagues, um, then I've given also a little overview on the, on the next slide over here, so I'm not going to read that, but this gives us an overview of the authors who actually developed a framework for scoping reviews. It started with Arxi and O'Malley, and then it was Levac, and I can't even pronounce these names, and O'Brien, and so forth, and, um, and we end up with Chihona Briggs Institute. So if you want to do a little bit of uh, Googling and finding out a little bit more, because in 45 minutes I can't possibly do justice to this beautiful methodology of, of a scoping review, but I do hopefully will leave you with some nuggets, so to speak, that you pick up at McDonald's, right? No. And um, so that you can just get a sense of, um, you know, we, where can we go to to get more information? And here is like a bit of a, a, a it's not a comparison, but it, it shows us the development from 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 Oxy to 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 O'Brien and then lastly to Peters and so forth. So now let's get a little closer at least to Atlas TI. Now people yeah, let me put it this way. Oftentimes people say, no, don't give us steps. Other people say, yes, we do want steps. Okay, so Bridget decided, okay, let me just give you a few steps at least, because it sometimes is helpful just to get an overview. Okay, these are not the specifics, but some, I do do some specifics and others, no, not so much. So what does Jonah Briggs uh, Institute tell us about scoping reviews? Yes, you obviously look at the literature on a specific topic. 
Okay. Oftentimes these areas are new, emerging, or complex. Okay, so that's that's for starters. You have to follow a certain protocol. Um, you look at the title, the background, blah, 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 and so forth. And here is an important uh, some for those of you who've never heard of a scoping review, you will hear a lot about uh, the eligibility criteria. That means in simple English colleagues, what is in and what is out. Up to when are we searching? Are we only searching UK journals? Are we only searching USA journals? Are we doing both? Whatever. In other words, in simple English colleagues, you need to uh, manage the boundary and you have to define the boundary in terms of where you're going with the search of um, of literature that means of articles that you are looking at so this uh, this is this is this is a big job by the way okay then you need to go to the databases okay and and and, and just a footnote colleagues make a friend in the library Okay, because many of our students, and sorry, I'm speaking now from a South African perspective, because this is where I do my supervision and my teachings and so forth. Many of our students actually still do not know how to get to a database and, and cannot, you know, they don't know about ERIC, they don't know about Scopus, they don't know about Web of Science and so forth. So that's the first thing. So make a friend in the library. The next aspect that you also need to think about is the use of reference managers. Uh, particularly if you do a scoping review and or a systematic lit review for that matter. And there are many on the market. Um, I personally like to use Mendeley uh, because I no longer have the privilege of, of accessing these things from the university because in South Africa it works differently by the way than the UK. And, but there are others. There are, there's a table that, which is also open source but RefWorks, RefWorks to a point and so forth. So these are uh, software packages that assist us with managing our um, articles. In other words, the theoretical data. That's what I call them as well. Right. Now, where does Atlas TI come in now? First, the first, next step is to select relevant sources of evidence. Those, that means those articles. Okay. And you need to do this by screening because you're going to start off with a thousand articles and for the life of you, you cannot read all thousand articles so there needs to be a screening process which is an academic process by the way and um, and we firstly screen by title so what does that mean it means you need to read each and every title of of these articles that's the librarian or whoever put now into your inbox or into your mendeley or whatever and um and you can put all those all those articles into Atlas TI, by the way. Okay. Maybe Christina and Sarah must talk about when will Atlas crash. I don't know. Hopefully, I, yeah. I think about after a thousand. I don't know. I have no idea. Be that as it may, colleagues, Atlas TI can help us with this process of screening titles and screening abstracts. And there's a very quick way of doing that, and I'm going to show you that in a moment. Once you've decided and given the, the, the criteria that you have now applied with regards to what's in and what's out, you actually need to do a full text screening. And to that end, dear colleagues, you need to do some coding. And the coding is, again, something that we can speak endlessly about. And, and Sarah and, and Christina also, you know, they teach that, um, you know, I don't finish it. I mean, it's it's being done all over and 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 so forth. But it is a very sophisticated process. And I do want to refer also one more reading to you, and that's the latest book by Johnny Saldana, uh, fourth edition of um, what's it called again, the Coding Manual for Qualitative Researchers. So um, if you're interested, you know, you can email me afterwards, and I can give you some details. Right. Also, dear colleagues, what then needs to happen after you've screened it. Uh, your, your the full text. Now you need to start extracting. What does that mean? You take out certain segments of text of the articles to help you to understand, I'll go back to the first bullet, the emerging or complex research phenomenon. That is what you do. Okay. And Atlas TI can assist with that as well. And then last but not least, where Atlas TI is incredibly powerful, is the report function. So what we have extracted and charted, some people refer to what this extraction as charting, um, can then be um, um, converted into certain reports. And there are Excel reports, there are Word reports. The power here is, and this, I may not say this out loud, and it's dangerous for, for plagiarism and so forth, 
but ATSTI converts automatically from uh, PDF into Word. And this is really, really helpful once you need to start to write up and so forth. And there are lovely tables and diagrams and all sorts of other um, uh, functionalities uh, that are very helpful. So this is kind of where I plot Atlas TI, if you like, in the steps of the scoping review. And I hope it's reasonably uh, clear and I'm going to give a couple of screenshots uh, in a moment. You need to also present a flow diagram. We're going to talk about that just now. It's called the Prisma. And then last but not least, you need to speak to the findings uh, of, your, of your scoping review in terms of what does this mean, implications? What does it mean for research? What does it mean for theory? What does it mean for practice? What does it mean for policy? And then last but not least, the conclusion. So quick and dirty if you like, uh, but it gives you, I hope, a nice overview with regards to uh, the scoping review a la um, the Briggs Institute. Then I've just given you here some reasons why we should, or why you, why would you do a scoping review? And I was speaking to, to Christina and Sarah earlier on. I think in the world of COVID at the moment, people are very shy to go out into the field to collect uh, empirical data and probably would like to use new methodologies. And it is a methodology, by the way. And, and so forth. So just in, 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 in a nutshell, you can have a look at that. Just for interest's sake, giving you a bit of an overview of the differences between a systematic literature review and a scoping review, and you'll see that the scoping is, is, is broader and flexible and so forth. Mostly uh, it refers to qualitative data, but it's not just that. Okay, so it's a very bit of a s simplified kind of comparison. Okay, then I just quickly want to talk to you about searching um, and, and, and given that this is also about scoping review and not just Atlas, so I try to find a golden middle way in terms of what, what to present and what not to present. Um, but this is then also for our young scholars so, and maybe also for the experience, I don't know. But anyway, colleagues, I learned this from somewhere, I can't remember where, but there are entry points or vantage points if one gets into this forest of scholarship. Um, and, and what I've learned from my students, and they teach me far more than I can teach them actually, is that the, the forest of scholarship is, is, is so dense that, you won't, that oftentimes we don't see a single tree there. And, um, and it is our duty, I think, as supervisors um, and, and, and guides, whatever you call them in your country, that we would help our students just to, you know, to make this a little bit more accessible and facilitate that process. And they're basically three entry points, authors, keywords, and the journals. And, um, and, and this is how you kind of get into the game, so to speak. And I hope I can speak a little bit to that. I'm not going to mention, or you can read the slides also, but I do want to say something about authors. And if you're interested, please look at this up, the Lotka Law. It's something that is actually quite interesting. I call it the boys club, which is a little bit patronizing. So pardon me if I say that, guys, in the, if you are listening here tonight. I don't mean it in a patronizing way. It could also be the girls club, by the way. And, um, but it's about people who specialize over 30, 40 years, who kind of uh, cite one another, who, who have a huge impact on the impact factor. That was not good English, by the way. But anyway, and um, so, so, so this is something that's happening. Uh, people specialize on a certain topic and so forth. And it's important that when you get into your field or whatever you, you know, where, where you would like to position yourself with your scoping review, you need to know who are the key scholars in your field. And you will notice that by not only looking at the citation um, index and the H index and all that and the impact factor of the journal, but you will also have a look at the references that they offer at the end of the um, article and so forth. So there's, there's a little bit of a trick there and you need to do some learning with regards to that. Keywords are always important colleagues and you need to think carefully what the keywords are for your scoping review. What will you be looking for? What are the subject terms, which is sometimes the standard thesaurus and what are the keywords that the author has identified? So there's a difference between those two, and you might just want to be clear on that. So, um, so just in terms of the keywords. And then lastly, also journals. Colleagues, um, this is a minefield of note. And, um, and, and yeah, I, I, 
I could speak to this the whole evening, and I'm keeping an eye on my on my watch here also. Colleagues, it is um, it's 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 yeah. There are so many different journals, and you need to know what are the good journals, you know, so that you know you don't get into the game of the predatory journals and so forth. And I'm sure you've heard about that and so forth. But yeah, as college, you know, we tend one tends to you know aim high go to the best or to the specialized journals and so forth. And you need to know what these journals are. And for those young students at the emergent scholars amongst us colleagues, you need to speak to your supervisor about the journals. So just a little bit of um, just an overview. Google Scholar, blah, 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 and all these colleagues. There's a lot of criticism that is leveled against Google Scholar. And I do want to perhaps put you at ease. Google Scholar is not just bad. There's a lot of good stuff on Google Scholar, and at least it gets you going. And, um, and you can see what the citation index is. And there are a few tricks, actually, to work with Google Scholar to make it really worth your while. And unfortunately, I don't have time now to, to do that. So the searching strategy, in other words, just to as you do your search, you know, there it is. Uh, so you think about the databases that you need to access, the authors, the journals, the subject terms, the keywords, and so forth. You need to think about inclusion, exclusion criteria. Okay, the next slide speaks to that and so forth and yeah and and yeah you just have to think about these things on where to search by the way footnote uh, colleagues a scoping review and any kind of review is actually a team project to do a scoping review all on your own is is a little daunting i would argue but you may differ with me just a suggestion so here's an example of what's in and what's out okay the eligibility criteria so I would include, so this is now you talking, because also footnote, colleagues, your the process of doing a scoping review must be repeatable. That means if, or can should be somebody should be able to replicate it. Okay, it should be replicatable if there's a word like that. So somebody should be able to do it given the criteria, given the prisma, and given whatever, whatever. So here are, for instance, inclusion criteria. Um, you want all the articles that were published between 2007 and, say, November, whatever. And exclusion, in other words, would be anything that was published before. Okay, so that's just the opposite. Okay. Inclusion, say, for instance, you could speak English, uh, Spanish, sorry. So all the articles that are in English and in Spanish, they are in. And everything but, okay, like German and Afrikaans or Dutch or whatever is not included. And that's kind of how you then show the criteria or speak to the criteria then somebody else can go and say okay she only looked at the last 10 years so if i want to perhaps do a scoping review i'm going to go perhaps the last 20 years or whatever the case is okay i hope that is reasonably clear so i've mentioned the word prisma flowchart which comes also from the it's, it's used both in scoping reviews as well as in um, in in systematic literature reviews what it boils down to colleagues, and I'm just quickly going to talk to this, and I'm really worried about time. But anyway, colleagues over here, you start off with searching the database and N equals, say, a thousand or whatever the case is. Okay. And you have some additional, say, gray literature or whatever. Then you look for duplicates, and this is where Mendeley can assist you. Okay, to see what are the duplicates. So okay, let's get rid of those, and then this N number will reduce. You start screening and you say, nah, these type, nah, uh, uh, this is the title looks good, but actually it's not relevant. Or oh, the title is okay, but the abstract, when I read the abstract, it wasn't so cool after all, then those are excluded. And this is how you then get to full text um, um, you know, assessments in the sense that you look for uh, articles that actually speak to your phenomenon and do they meet the eligibility criteria, then another few are excluded and at the end you perhaps have n equals 10 and you started to say for instance with a thousand and the next slide actually gives us an example of that you can have a look at that in your own time here they started with 11,000 they ended up with what 102 at the very end so this is kind of how it works okay preparing then the literature that means preparing those articles this is with the um, courtesy of Steve. What's Steve's surname now? I forgot his surname. What? Right. What? What's his surname from England, from Lancaster? Anyway, yeah, you're correct. right. Steve yeah. Is, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so at courtesy to him, he he and I actually I did acknowledge him at the end of my slides, 
um, that he actually spoke to, he speaks to this. Do you have a system on your computer where you manage your literature, where you manage your important points, where you manage the methods literature and the theoretical literature and so forth? And, um, and again, I put in red is all about Atlas, and this is a wonderful way to, to work Atlas. Okay. There are multiple formats. I'm not going to speak to that now, but yes, what do we do? And I'm going to show that hopefully in a moment. I'm going to rush through the next couple of slides. Colleagues, yes, you're adding these documents. Documents are the articles that you would bring into a project. You have to rename them. That's a whole convention. That's something that you need to, in my, in my humble opinion, must do, should do, or it's highly suggested or recommended um, be, yeah, for various reasons. You need to comment and you can copy paste a citation for instance. You can group these documents according to date, authors and so forth. And I'm going to give you examples when we open it up. And we in Atlas can import uh, from a reference manager. For those who don't know Atlas TI, there is an interface. There is a connection, if you like, between the reference managers and Atlas TI. And any one of them, by the way, is, is relevant. Okay, so what I've done over here is just given you some screenshots of literally, you know, opening up the, the software and adding the documents. And you will see I've got nine documents over here and I have renamed them. Okay, renaming. It's literally a right click and you rename. And you will see that they are now according, you know, in, in sequential order here, numerical order, the date, and Smith is the author. I've just given keywords, and then I gave the abbreviation of the journal, which is the quality, whatever. And it has 31 codes, by the way, and it has been commented, which is that little tilde. So that ends up for. So, and this makes for a good overview of what you have in your container. Okay, which is the project. I was call. I, I speak to my students about a project as if it were a ship container with all sorts of nice goodies inside. Right. Then what you can do, and which I think is very important, particularly if you have really lots and lots and lots of data, or lots and lots of articles rather, is that you put that you group or that you put the documents in groups as per inclusion criteria. So the inclusion criteria in this instance could be, I want all the articles between 2005 and 2008. You could have another one from 2008 to 2000 and whatever. Then you can have all the articles written by Fritz, all the articles that have to do something with feminology or just research in general, all those written by Smith. I just took my own stuff so that I don't tread on any toes, uh, uh, given that this is public, um, will be out in the public domain. Then I have another little trick that I want to add to your to your system of thinking about articles is by actually ranking them. And a five star hotel in South Africa is the highest that you can get and which is really a nice stay, whereas a one star you actually don't want to go there. So maybe if you have a ranking system, if you want to, okay, this is not a has you know have to do, but it's just a nice uh, perhaps way of um, of ranking your article. Say so this is definitely one that I really need to read from the beginning to the very end. It's like with books. Um, some books you only read a chapter, others just a paragraph, and other books I've read certainly. Like for in one book that I did read for my PhD was Ian Day, because he those days he was the guy to read for qualitative data analysis. Just by the way, okay, so. So now we get now play 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 that we have our an article in in our container we've opened it up and what you do what you can do now which I would just strongly suggest is to do screen uh, sorry title screening and this is what I do I select the segment of text and um, and I just call it title okay and the next thing that I also do is I select the abstract and I call it abstract okay so this is abstract screening and so I go through all my articles and I select the title and call it title go to the next article do, and, 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 and do the same over I hope that is reasonably clear and I'll show it you in a moment what you then can get or make is what they would call a report okay now we're moving towards taking the work that we've done in Atlas, taking it out of Atlas into MS Word, and hopefully we can then work with whatever we need to do. And this particular report is based on the work on, on, on segments of text that I coded title. And here I have all the titles, okay, of each and every article. 
Now you may say, no, what the heck? Why, why must I do this? If you have 50 of those, or you have just one of a group of, of, of SMIT or a group of, of a, rain, you know, a date, you know, 2010 to 2021 or whatever, uh, then, then you can get a good overview. What are the titles that speak to my research phenomenon? Because at the end of the day, a scoping review also speaks to a research phenomenon. It is something that you wish to understand better. Okay, in simple English, you can hear that I perhaps am too simplistic about it. How else can STI assist? Yes, there are word clouds and word counts, which are very helpful for those of us who are lazy. It's No, it's just Bridget that's lazy, lazy in this group. And we use the word cloud just to get an overview quickly. What's going on in an article? You don't want to read it. So it's also part of the screening process and so forth. And I've just given you a little uh, screenshot of that. For instance, if you if you wondered if this article is about policy, it certainly is about policy because it is in the middle. It has the most uh, used uh, or it's, it's, it's the largest print, if you like. That means it has been used most often. And the other way to look at it is in a word list. And um, in fact, it has been used 182 times. So um, just a little bit of that. OK, then we select text. OK, I'm not going to go through that. Um, you may read in your own time about deductive coding and inductive coding. Um, I have a way of, of planning the kind of coding uh, quite systematically in terms of what, does the, what are the keywords of the articles. I give it a prefix of a hashtag, for instance. So then I know what comes from the article in terms of a code and what is me, my, my thinking about uh, codes. That, those I call inductive codes. Okay, that is article driven, so to speak. And then also, dear colleagues, there is a, is a search and code functionality, which is like the old, you know, automatic kind of coding. And I always give it a prefix AC. AC stands for automatic coding. And then I add whatever, so that in the code list, I would recognize what is, what is from the work of the author, what's from scholarship. The others are me, Bridget, and the others are searches as I ran through some of these um, uh, articles. And here's an example, like AC quantitative and so and so forth. Okay, so just a little bit. But can you see what is important perhaps is to have a look at um, how I structure this. Methods, focus groups, method qualitative, theory, activity theory, theory diversity, theory whatever. Because as you go through these um, uh, um, 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 articles, you will learn how to, um, you know, how to discern what are the different theories that speak to your research phenomenon, then there's a very systematic way of doing that. Okay, I've given you some useful codes here. Also courtesy of, uh, what's her name? What's her name from Australia? What's that lady's name? Um, man, me and names, Pat, Pat, Pat. Is it Pat? What's Pat's her name? Pat Faisley. Donkey, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, I've also learned uh, quite a bit from her. Anyway, and then we bring it into Atlas. And, um, and there are some documents and some groupings. Okay, right. Uh, also for writing apps, there are lots of different networks and, and, and uh, visual representations of the work that you can do and so forth. And um, for instance, this is a little network. And there's another um, example of a research report, no, not a research report, an Atlas TI report, sorry. And this report has to do with identity. I was also doing a lot of work on identity. And I wanted to see in all the articles, okay, where, where, where does the word identity even feature? And I did a little auto coding. I'll just call it auto coding, search and code functionality in the text search. And um, yeah, and then if you have to write up something, in terms of conceptualizing, for instance, the phenomenon of identity from the perspective of scholarship in the past 20 years or what, 10 years or whatever, whatever, then that is a beautiful way, beautiful, listen to me, way to do this. Another uh, wonderful way of presenting your, your work and giving, getting an overview of what the heck is going on in your, in your, um, in your coding system. Uh, the code document table is very helpful. And sadly, I am seriously running out of time. Additional strategies, set up alerts. Do you need to be registered on this ORCID ID and so forth? And um, watch out for impact. Ah, no. Uh, go for impact, high impact factor. Um, 
journals and leave the sharks alone. <laughs> and there's just an overview and a checklist and yeah, that's it. Okay. Right, just some acknowledgements, Stellenbosch University, Steve Wright, and also Ani, uh, I'm sure Christina remembers, and Sarah, you remember Ani from Malaysia. And for those who want to learn more about this, please visit the Cochrane um, Institute. Um, they are, a lot of my thinking and so forth comes from them, so all honor and glory to them. And that is it. <laughs> wow, that was a bit of a rush. Um, I thought, let me um, just escape here. Christina, I know it was very really rushed. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. Bridget, you, it was uh, very enjoyable. I was just thinking mm. how much detail you put in there. It was really useful and lots of tips um, and ideas and uh, things to think about. And I really thought you you did infotain us. I love that. Uh, that's <laughs> a new word that I've uh, written down. Yeah, um, good. I've given so. you a new word. That's excellent. <laughs> Uh, and some sweet. lovely analogies yeah. as well. I really like the analogies. Are you going to show us some, yes, some things uh, in Atlas now? Yes, I have just opened up Atlas whilst you... Uh, excellent. Okay. Right, colleagues. Right, just a little bit of playing around. So what I've done is I have opened up a project, uh, Atlas TI, and we are currently on version 915. And um, and what I've done over here is, okay, let me just quickly, for those of you who find this all new, it's file, home, search and code, and these are your tabs and ribbons and what, what, what. Here is your, your navigator, your browser, as you would have it in your, um, 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 on your Windows browser. And in this particular instance, I let me just click here on documents. There's a little arrow there. And I have some articles there which I have now renamed, actually, if I can just open it, you know, Atlas TI sometimes takes a bit of time to find itself. And in this, I have a few articles in here. Uh, there are 14 of them. If we can just get going, that would be really cool, but it's not there we are finally. So let me just enlarge that. And um, what I've done over here is I have selected as okay so we okay let me just try and be a little bit systematic here so colleagues we've done our searches we have now decided here are my 50 articles or my 10 articles or my five articles whatever whatever going you know having gone through the prisma and selecting and deselecting and adhering to the um, criteria to what should be in and what should be out and now you've decided okay I've got 14 play play articles over here um, with regards to my phenomenon that I wish to understand. But now perhaps that, that's one way of doing it, by the way. On the other hand, you could also do, you can have, say, 100 in here and use Atlas to help you with the screening. Okay, so it depends. Okay, on the one hand, I can use these 14 and say there, there's, that's my final group and now I can start coding. Okay, which then is a whole new lecture with regards to how do we code, what do we code, and to that end, I've given you a few um, codes that are quite that are very handy. Be that as it may, what I've done over here, I've created a, a code which is called the title, and here then you will see that that segment of text is um, is, is is highlighted. Um, equally so, over here is another. Um, there's an article I just called a title. Now, just to show you then how, how we, you know, how we get this now out of Atlas, because often people say to me, yes, but it's all very well. You've done all this work. Now, how the heck do you get it out? So I always in doubt. When in doubt, you go home. That's an old, old adage. Um, it's like when you had too much to drink, you go home. So in Atlas, we also go home and we then go to our code managers, which is over here. And we click on codes or you could do that from the whatever. And over here, I have a code list, which exactly two codes. So it's not really a list, it's just two codes. But if I click on title and I go up to, 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 to my report, I can create a report. I'm just going to leave it by default, whatever is there. And, um, and I can get a report out, hopefully still today. Yes, thank you. And I can save this as a Word document and I can go and read what are the various titles 
that could possibly speak to my research phenomenon. I know I'm repeating myself, but I do it deliberately because um, it's always about the research question. What is it that you are investigating? Another cool, if you like, cool, a nice way of, of working data is to perhaps look at the abstracts. You know, if you have, say, take and also start small. I believe in small successes. Um, so I do I do rather just 10 articles and then another 10 and then another 10. Because if I have to do 100, I will run away and do shopping or something else because it feels too overwhelming. But reading perhaps art, uh, abstracts in one go, I would say print this out, go into the garden or wherever you are and read it on paper just to do something different. Okay, or you put it into word and let it read out loud to you, or something like that. It, it just you get it better. Okay, I have all these little things that I that I teach sort of in betweens, which which are very helpful to make your life a little easier. I hope. So that's one way. The other thing that I also want to just mention, dear colleagues, and that is, um, and this is probably the last thing I'm going to say here because I see my time is seriously now in jeopardy here. Colleagues, people talk about finding the gap. In, in the literature. And I know most of my students, when, when I say that to them, they look at me and say, what the heck do you actually mean? And it, it, it's far, it, it, it sounds so easy, find the gap. You know, how do we do that? And I think Atlas TI can really teach us or help us at least to do this a little bit more systematically. So I'm just selecting a segment of text over here and I'm just going to apply a code and I'm going to call this theory because I want to find out the theory. Let me just spell correctly if I can today. And this is symbolic interaction, just SI for lap because I don't have time. And, and then I close. And so I can go through, colleagues, what I've just done over here, through all the articles. And I actually don't have to read. In case you didn't know, I didn't read. I look for a heading. What heading am I looking for? The theory, theoretical framework, conceptual framework, a framework, an analytical framework, um, a model or whatever. And I select that segment of text that speaks to theory and I, and I code it theory underscore activity theory. Theory underscore the next one is whatever, systems theory or whatever. And then I can go back home and I can go to my codes. By the way, I could also click over here just to show you another way. I could click over here and I could get all the theories, put them into a group and make a report. And then I can have on an Excel sheet for those who like to work with Excel, you can actually make yourself a little table, if you like, or in Word. And you can then say, I reviewed the literature systematically and I found that most articles used symbolic interactionism and many of the articles or whatever used activity theory but very few uh, articles used um, what you call it um, say systems theory or whatever the case may be so this is a nice way of um, of being systematic and this is also not just for scoping reviews by the way this is also for the traditional um, uh, literature review and the only difference that I teach my students and that's hopefully the last thing I'm going to say is that I tell my students you're doing a literature study which goes hand in hand with the empirical work and to that end I say to them you are reviewing the literatures plural systematically that does not mean you're doing a systematic literature review because a systematic literature review is a specific methodology but doing a literature study means you have to search and review also the literatures. So that is just in a nutshell. Colleagues, I know this is very quick and dirty. Uh, I hope it wasn't too dirty. But um, but yeah, I hope you learned something. You're welcome to email me and talk to me and speak to Christina and Sarah. And yeah, I hope I met some of your expectations. I, I, I know that I couldn't have met everybody's expectations, but it is... Um, it is a quick, quick, quick rushed story today. Well, Thanks, Christina. You're Thank welcome. You. Bridget, I think we can tell very much from the chat that you have met uh, our expectations. As I said earlier, I really enjoyed it. Um, there are a few questions, if that's OK. Yes, um, I, I, hope, could, I hope I can answer them. No guarantees. Huh? <laughs> so uh, just a, a few questions from attendees, and then if you've got time, maybe a couple from me as well. Yes, of um, course. 
but you gave us some um, really in-depth insight into the sort of range of types of ways that literature can, can be reviewed at the beginning, um, which is really helpful. So thanks for that. And a lot of kind of myriad of terms that are used to refer mm. to these different ways. Um, and so there are a couple of questions that related to that. Um, so first of all, from Johanna, who asked if um, when defending a PhD, whether it's necessary to give different definitions for a particular key term? Uh, that depends. <laughs> um, I, I would, I would just take, I would, I would just give it a, a quick and dirty response once again in saying, look, this is what I did. I'm aware of the others. And, um, but it's not, this is not a test of either. It's not a test about definitions as far as I'm concerned. And um, so that, that, that would be, I think not really fair if somebody said what's the definition of a rapid systematic literature review or something like that. Um, I would just, you know, as a student would say I'm very aware of other, um, 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 what you call it, names if you like, or typologies with regards to the, these reviews. What I did for my PhD was ABC. And um, just, yeah, that's, I think that would be my way of, of tackling that particular question. I, I don't think a professor will ask you the definitions, uh, Johanna, really. Okay. Sorry to be so blunt. <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you. Um, so related to that from Amir, who asked two, well, maybe three questions, actually. Uh, oh, so I'll yeah. start with the first one. <laughs> uh, he says, do scoping reviews include assessment of the rigour of the included studies um, uh, not and a comparison of that across mm, the studies? Yeah. Is that part um, of it? It's, 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 it, it could be, but it's more required if you do a systematic literature review. That is what I've learned over the years. So it's not really about, is this now a rigorous, uh, credible kind piece of work? Um, my, my guiding line would there be that, we, that you go to journals that, are, that, that have a rigorous reviewing process, and then you can be pretty sure, if I may, uh, that the articles that are published there, that they are of quality. And that is why I don't go to dodgy journals uh, for mm -hmm. starters. But in scoping review, that is not a requirement in terms of making it or analyzing or assessing uh, the rigor of that particular um, article. Mm. So is that one of the differences then between a systematic yeah. review and a yes. scoping review? I, I, I stand to be corrected, but I think so, yes, yes. Okay. We can check it up. We can have a look at it together. <laughs> well, there's so many of them, aren't there? Yeah. yeah Great. Yeah. Okay. So he follows that up um, with uh, a question, a couple of questions about kind of theoretical frameworks. So first mm. of all, how common is it for scoping reviews to have a theoretical framework in the published pa pa paper? So he says, um, since literature searching involves many decisions on the selection and synthesis, and that involves analysis, might being explicit about a theoretical framework make the review more trustworthy? That's a very good question, and I actually don't have a, a golden answer for that. Um, it is similar to, and again, I stand to be corrected, I don't really think you have to, okay, let me put it this way. Um, whether you're doing a scoping review or whatever kind of research, you're wishing to understand a certain phenomenon, right? That that would that that's my point of departure, mm -hmm. and if 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 there's a certain theory that would shed light on um, the other theories that have been offered, yes, then I would perhaps not do a theoretical framework, but perhaps a conceptual framework where I can have more than one, you know, where that can have a couple of concepts and perhaps middle range theories that I could add into that frame. So that would be my quick answer for now. Um, my, my next response would be, I think we need to then also find perhaps for our people uh, good examples of scoping reviews and see how that was done. So um, just as a, as a quick answer to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a uh, question, I'm just saying thank mm. you in the chat as well. Mm. Um, I, <laughs> um, I had an, a question um, mm. about something more specific in terms of something that you showed or talked about mm. in terms of your use of Atlas TI. Mm. Um, and I really liked your idea of ranking the articles using stars Mm. Um, but I wasn't sure where you were doing that, Bridget. Were you doing I that? I didn't. I didn't. You're quite right. I, I was going to do it still. I was going to add it. You can actually add it in front of the, you just, the renaming. 
Okay. As you as you rename, you could just put the stars in. I'm sorry, I apologize. I should have. No, put that's it there. fine. Just showing you. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's just really interesting. Yeah. I haven't thought about that way of, yeah. of capturing. And that's a really simple way, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is because then you can really have the five stars and the four stars and the three stars all in a group. And then you can have this cross analysis because say it's your article, right? Silver yeah. is a five star. She will be in the five star group and she will be in the silver group and she will be in the feminology group, for instance, or whatever. And then yeah. you get really interesting cross analyses and cross whatever, whatever with regards to the way you work those um, articles. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's an example, isn't it, of how you might use different places mm. or different tools mm. within the software to capture the same thing so that you can kind of cut around it in different ways. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No, I thought that was really cool. Thank you for okay. that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> At least There's another question from me. <laughs> yes, yes, go well, ahead. Well, it's always great to hear how other people do it, isn't it? So yeah, exactly. You and I, yeah, you and I were talking about it when I was in Surrey. You said, yeah, you attend workshops from other people so that we can learn from one another. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, nice. absolutely. Yes. Uh, sorry, yes, I interrupted. Yes. No worries. So um, I think I've gathered all the questions that were in the chat. So one more from me. Um, you shared with us, I think it was Grant and Booth's ty typology for of review types. Mm. Um, but I just wondered, maybe this is not a very fair question, but mm. I'll ask it anyway. Do you have any quick sort of high level advice um, about how to choose between those types? How do I know when to do one type of review as opposed to another one? <laughs> I'm just going to throw it right back to you, Christina, and say, go read the article. Um, okay. Okay. That's you know what the article no, no, discusses, yeah, no. is it? Yeah. Yeah. It's actually, yeah. A, and it's a short article. It, it's, it won't take you forever. And I can actually email it to you. You know what, uh, um, Christina and colleagues, I am, I am personally a scoping review girl, if you like. Because um, I've taught now also at least uh, with systematic reviews and so forth. And that's fine. systematic literature reviews are for me, they come from the medical sciences also. Okay, that's where it started, the Cochrane. These are all medical people and so forth. So I find the scoping review a little bit more gentle, if you like, if that's, I know this is not good English or a real accurate description of what to do but it's kind of it's a little bit more flexible and that is what I like about a scoping mm -hmm. review mm -hmm. and um, and those are basically I would say systematic literature review and a, um, a scoping review and then what I do with an international project we do a realist synthesis review and uh, up to now I, I still don't quite get it what that is so um, so yeah so there are these different things and and, and one has to read a little bit on them. So I don't have a quick and you know quick answer for you. Um, but that that article is a very helpful one. If you want it, I can email it to you tonight. If you yeah, want. that would be great. Thank mm. you very much. And I think we're coming to our end. The end. It's lovely to have these sure. chats, but we're kind of mm. running out of time. And I guess if anybody else has any further follow up questions, they can either email. put them in the chat now or they can email yeah. um, us. Sure. And I'm, I'm sure you'd be. Uh, willing to uh, respond to those by email. Sure, um, sure. Great, thank you. So uh, thanks again. Uh, as I said, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, it's uh, lots of food for thought. Um, and I just wanted to kind of finish up by thanking everybody else for attending today. It's great to have you all here. Uh, great to have so many people um, attend the webinar and stay right to the end. That's testament to how enjoyable it was. You can see on the screen that we've got um, a course coming up in Atlas TI. So if anyone's interested, then do check out our website. Um, and if you have any ideas for other webinars that you would like us to host, or indeed if you're using software for your own uh, research uh, and you'd like to uh, deliver a webinar, we're really keen to hear from you. Um, so that we can continue these uh, great discussions with researchers around the world using digital tools. So uh, I will uh, bid you all uh, farewell. Thank you very much again. Uh, wish you all the best. Keep safe and well uh, and hope to see you at our next um, webinar in a couple of weeks time. Thanks for having me. God bless everybody. <laughs> Thanks Bridget. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye. Take care Sarah. Take yeah, care you too. Christina Keep and well. everybody else.